a lot of ground to cover, and I'm going to have to move as fast as I can. Uh, and this subject of, of Armageddon and the Seven Last Plagues, it's commonly what is called the time of great tribulation. And it's one of the most serious, uh, uh, of the Bible's most serious messages that has to do here with these seven last plagues, because the plagues are one of the most terrible manifestations of God's wrath in the entire Bible. And, and it can be a very unsettling subject. It can be very troubling. It can, it can be a little bit disturbing. And so we have to realize, as we're about to study this, that the principle of God's love exists from Genesis to Revelation all the way throughout the Bible. Isn't that right? God is a God of love. But we also see in the Bible that He is a God of justice. That's another principle of who God is. God is always a perfect balance of these characteristics. And so the principle of his justice does exist. And at times, God draws lines. There are times in the history of humanity when the cup of man's sin and guilt and rebellion uh, overflows and God has to step in and deal with it. And so when the cup of God's wrath becomes full, it spills over without mercy on willfully unrepentant men and women. I'm not talking about people who are repentant, people who want to change and want to respond to God. I'm talking about willful, stubborn, unrepentance and rebellion. Now, one of those times that we see God's cup of wrath overflow and pour out was at the flood, wasn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, uh, when, when God had to send the flood to destroy the world because mankind was in such rebellion and, there, and, and so sinful that God was sorry that he made mankind. And then another time when we see God's wrath overflow is at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah when he sent fire and brimstone to destroy those immoral rebellious cities. And, and the Bible describes one final time when God's wrath that is again poured out on the world in seven fearful and terrible plagues. And I want us to go into the Bible, and I believe that God is going to speak very, very powerfully to our hearts this evening, because God intends that the things that we're about to look at together are to be very soberly and seriously considered. Now, even when, but, but even before I get there, I, I still want to come back to God's love. And, and here's the issue. Even when God realizes that he has to step in, and bring justice and pour out his wrath and execute judgment in his love and desire to save people, he always sends warning messages ahead of the coming judgment, right? Think back to Noah's day. Isn't, isn't that what happened? Didn't God have Noah preach to the people for 120 years, warning them that the flood was coming, that he was building an ark right in front of their eyes so that they could see the, the means of their escape and their salvation. And, and, and so God gave this warning message so that people wouldn't have to be destroyed if they'd listened to it. They had ample time to repent and to prepare. And the same thing again at Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was living there. He was a witness to the people of godliness. God sent angels into the city to warn the people. And, and so God always sends warnings before the judgment comes. And it's the same thing for us in the last days. Revelation chapter 15 and 16 is where you find the seven last plagues. And these plagues are God's judgments on an unrepentant world. But remember, because God is a God of mercy and wants everyone to be saved, before he sends his judgments, he sends a warning message. And that warning message comes in Revelation chapter 14 before we get to the plagues in 15 and 16. And he sends this, this warning message and he's saying that it's for the whole world, the Bible tells us, and that if people will listen to it, they will be spared the judgments of the seven last plagues and they will be saved. And so God sends, in fact, in the last days, he sends three angels with messages. It's one warning message, but there's really three parts to it. And, and so I want to just read and review them real quickly here with you. We've looked at them all in more detail already in the seminar, but I want, I want to summarize them for context. These are the messages that God says, if you listen to them, you will be spared the seven last plagues. Revelation 14, verse 6, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. This is the eternal good news that he's coming to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, 
Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then verse 8, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then uh, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He, excuse me, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so those are the three warnings that God sends. He gives three distinct warning messages in one final message before he pours out the plagues. And those people who ignore these warning messages do so to their own damnation according to the Bible. And so I really want to encourage each and every one of us here this evening, please pay attention to this. Listen carefully to this. If God is calling you to give Him glory and to worship Him, and that's a direct quote from the fourth commandment, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, then you want to worship God in that way. If God has spoken to you and told you that Babylon has fallen, this system of false and confused religious teachings, and He's called you out of those false teachings and traditions, God says obey that and you will be spared the seven last plagues. Then he says, well, when he says, don't worship the beast or receive his image or, or, or receive his mark, then if you worship God and obey him instead and get the seal of God instead, then God says you will be spared the seven last plagues. And so it's very important that we heed God's warning messages tonight. And I, I'm making this strong and heartfelt appeal to you out of a heart of love. I'm going to say some very, very blunt things tonight, but I'm doing it because I love you and I care about you and I want you to understand this is God's heart of love and He's giving us these warnings. And so I appeal to you from the depths of my heart, please listen and pay attention. Now folks, these are called the seven last plagues, which means that there had to be some what? If these are the last ones, what did there have to be? Some first ones, that's right. There, and, and where did the first plagues fall? In Egypt, that's right. They hit Egypt. And, and so you know how Pharaoh kept refusing to let Israel go until finally the tenth plague came, which was really a life and death issue, wasn't it? The tenth plague was a life and death issue. And I want to look here at chapter 11 of Exodus, and we're going to read... Um, verses 4 through 7 here. Exodus 11, uh, verses 4 through 7. And the Bible says, Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall what? Die. From the firstborn of Egypt who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there should be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as it was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And so this is literally a life and death issue. God said, everything that's firstborn is going to die. And he says, I'm doing this for one reason. I'm doing it to show you that there's a distinction, there's a difference between those who serve the gods of Pharaoh and those who serve the God of Israel. And when all the firstborn of the young godly that was in that land died, God right there made a marked distinction between my people, he said, over here, and it pays to serve the living God of Israel, and their Pharaoh, there is your side, and look what you have suffered, look what you have come under judgment with. And so God is doing the same thing at the end of time. He brings a life and death issue before us, whether we will receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. In other words, whether we are going to choose to obey all God's truth 
including the Sabbath, or whether we choose the traditions of men, including Sunday. It is life and death, dear friends. And through the mark of the beast, God shows who's on his side and who's not. And God exalts and he honors his people who receive the seal of God. Those who follow the beast and worship the beast and receive the mark, they end up getting destroyed. And through this, God makes a crystal clear distinction who's on his side and who is not on his side. And only those who allow the Holy Spirit to seal them with the truth in their minds, only those who receive the seal of God, they alone are the ones who are going to escape the seven last plagues according to God's word. And Revelation 15 and 16 are such horrible chapters that, that I, I'm just a little hesitant even to dive into them. And, and so I, I want to say this. If you have already settled it, with God to be sealed with truth and to stop lingering in Babylon. And that means to come out of Babylon and become part of a Sabbath keeping church. If you have made that decision, then you can sit back tonight and you can relax because this message is not for you. But if you haven't made that decision, if you are still lingering in Babylon, I want to appeal to you in a very fervent way. I want to appeal to you, and so does God want to appeal to you. Please consider this carefully. If you've not made that decision, then everything that we're about to read about, that's going to fall upon you big time. And there comes a time when you and I have to get off the fence. We can't try to have it both ways. We can't try to live in two worlds. We've got to quit walking the edge. We can't try to have God over here in one hand and traditions of men over here in the other hand and say, well, I'm just going to kind of meet halfway. There is no halfway. God said, you'll seek me and find the way you search for me with all your heart. We've got to sell out and go all the way with God and with truth or get off. There's no in between. Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, because this is really the introduction into this whole passage about the seven last plagues. Revelation 15, verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Now, he introduces the seven last plagues, and because they're so terrible, he actually pauses and and does a cutaway to an encouraging passage he knows that what's coming is so bad that he wants to give a picture of the fact that yes people are going to make it through people are going to get the victory they're not going to succumb to the beast in his mark that's verses two through four so we've already studied those several times so he introduces the seven last plagues in verse one now picking up in verse five after these things i looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in br pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bulls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And get this, no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now verse 8 is especially significant because it says that no one can go into the temple until the plagues are over. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I want to assure you of something. Today, Heaven's Temple is wide open for business. Jesus is still our High Priest in the Heavenly Sanctuary. He is still ministering forgiveness and mediation and intercession. Everybody can come boldly today before the throne of grace and find mercy and pardon and help for our weakness because we have a living High Priest who is still doing His ministry. The door of mercy still stands open. Hallelujah. We should be grateful for that tonight, that there is still opportunity for change, for repentance, for forgiveness, for choosing to walk with God and do what is right. But dear friends, once the first plague falls, it is too late. Because God says that nobody can enter the temple. There's no more repentance, and in fact, you're going to see that. There's no more Jesus. 
I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please help me change and, and take away my sins. Please save me now. There's no more of that going on. Everything's over. You're either saved or you're lost. And right now, right in this room tonight, everybody in the world, all around us throughout the whole world, is either in the process of receiving the seal of God or else in the process of receiving the mark of the beast. And if Jesus, by the way, this is kind of interesting when you think about it, really should bring the issue to, to, to the forefront of our consciousness. Right now, if Jesus were to decide that now is the time he was coming, if the Father decided now is the time he's going to send Jesus, boom, this is it. He could, and he knew that right now mercy's door is closed. He could look into every one of our conscious minds in this room tonight and he would see either the Father's name being written there or he would see either the beast's name being written there. Every living person he could judge just like that and it could all be over. And so all of us that are in this room tonight are going in that process one way or the other. We're either on the path to receive the seal of God or we're on the path to receive the mark of the beast. And, and Jesus knows which path we're on. And if it were over now, that would seal our fate. And Revelation 16 is so horrible that before we really dive into it, I want to make sure that we get some assurance. So let's go to Psalm 91. Uh, Psalm 91, just to have some assurance here from the Word of God. Uh, to share with you. So, um, uh, you, I want you to understand that those who have decided to follow truth, this passage of scripture, this is for you, this promise is for you. Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the, from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Oh, my dear friends, I don't know if you just noticed what the Bible said right there. When we come to face the great tribulation of the last days, the Bible says that God's truth will be our what? Shield and buckler. In other words, it's going to be what protects us. The truth and the truth alone is the only thing that will pr protect us in the last days. Why is that? Well, it's because when we studied uh, the other night about the mark of the beast, we saw that when we believe the word of truth, which is God's word, God's law, and God's son, Jesus, it allows the Holy Spirit to seal those things in us, and we receive the seal of God. That's why his truth is our shield and our buckler. And so when you and I face the tribulation of the last days, if we've allowed the Holy Spirit to seal these things in us, then we have nothing to fear because we've got the seal of God and that truth that the Holy Spirit has sealed, sealed in our minds will be our shield and buckler. If you've got the traditions of men, you're going to be wiped out. If you've got the commandments of men, you're not going to last for a minute. There's no excuse for that. But when you have the truth, you have it all. Truth is the most precious thing that we have in our world tonight. Let's be careful how we treat it, dear friends. Carrying on in verse 5, it says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, and neither shall what? Any plague come near your dwelling, for he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Aren't you so glad of that this evening, dear friends? God says that no plague is even going to come near your home. Don't have to worry about it. Just like the Israelites, the, the, the plagues were wiping out the Egyptians all around them, but the Israel was just fine because they had the blood over the door. 
they had obeyed the word of God, right? God said, put the blood over the door, and that's how the angel will pass over you. And if the blood of Jesus is over your door, and you are not only living in a faith relationship to him, but a faith relationship that leads you to obey, because that's what genuine faith is, I want you to know, all of you that have made that decision to follow Jesus and uh, live up to the truth that you've learned here, you have the assurance of this psalm that no plague is going to come near your dwelling. You're in great shape. Now, Revelation 16. It's very interesting that in each of the seven last plagues, they all hit a specific area of false worship or error that the world has chosen ahead of God. And in these plagues, the people who have rebelled against God get so much of what they've chosen ahead of God that it literally kills them. It's like the little boy who loved German chocolate cake. Now, I'm a big boy, and I love German chocolate cake. <laughs> Okay, so he loved German chocolate cake. And his mother would, uh, this was their kind of standard dessert for after dinner. And so every week she'd buy a German chocolate cake. And they would have German chocolate cake most times for dessert in the evening. And the little boy developed a very bad habit of stealing German chocolate cake because he loved it so much. And his mom, she knew what was going on, and, but she didn't know what to do about it. She tried everything to break him of this habit. She spanked him, it didn't cure him. She grounded him, it didn't cure him. She gave him extra chores to do, it didn't cure him. She took away his allowance, it did. Nothing worked to stop him from stealing German chocolate cake. Finally one day, she went and bought, instead of one, she bought two German chocolate cakes. She brought them home and she said, son, mommy does not want you to steal any of this cake. Is that clear, John? Yes, mommy. If you steal any of this cake, mommy is going to punish you very severely, Johnny. Do you understand? Yes, mommy. So they had their supper and then they had their dessert. And after Johnny went to bed, mom went down and she took a pencil and put a really faint line on the cake sheet. So she would know if Johnny stole anything. Then she went to work. Johnny was home from school. When she got home from work, she went and checked the cake. And sure enough, Johnny had cut a sliver off of that cake. And he didn't think she'd be able to tell it because she put the little mark. She knew. And Johnny was playing outside in the backyard. So she went out onto the back patio and said, Johnny. Come here. Yes, Mommy. So uh, Johnny came running over to Mommy, and then she said, Johnny, look at me. Johnny looked at Mommy. Johnny, did you steal some cake? Johnny kind of looked away a little bit, kind of squirmed a little bit. She said, Johnny, tell Mommy the truth. Did you steal some cake? Yes or no? Finally, Johnny said, Yes, Mommy. Johnny, come inside for your punishment. Yes, Mommy. She said, Son, I'm going to actually give you an unusual punishment today. She went and she got the German chocolate cake out of the fridge. She got a plate. She got a knife. She got a fork. She got a glass. Filled it up with milk. She cut a great big piece of cake off put it on Johnny's plate and put the plate in front of him and said, Johnny, for your punishment today, you have to eat German chocolate cake. Mommy, what? Johnny, you have to eat that cake for your punishment. Really, Mommy? You're going to punish me with German chocolate cake? Yes, son. Okay, Mom. So Johnny just powered through that piece of German chocolate cake. He loved it. At the end of it, she said to him, Johnny, was that good? Oh, yes, Mommy, that was delicious. She said, would you like another piece? Another piece? He never got two pieces of German chocolate cake. Oh, yes, Mom, I would love another piece. So she cut him another big piece off, put it on his plate. Johnny ate all the way through that piece of German chocolate cake. And she says, son, was that good? Oh, it was delicious, Mom. Would you like another piece? Really? Another one? Yeah. And so she cut a third piece off, put it on his plate. 
Johnny was powering through it. He got about two thirds of the way through, and then he got full of German chocolate. He said, Mom, he said, I, I'm full. I can't eat any more cake. She said, Hun, Son, you know, you have to clean your plate up. You can't leave food behind. Finish your cake. So Johnny finished his cake. She said, Was that good? Yeah, yeah, that was good, Mom. Okay, Johnny, here's another piece. Put another piece on his plate. Eat it. Johnny ate that piece. She said, Okay, another piece. Cut another piece. Put it on his plate. She made Johnny eat German chocolate cake until Johnny vomited German chocolate cake. <laughs> Guess what? Johnny never stole German chocolate cake again. In fact, he didn't even like German chocolate cake after that. And, and so I'm not recommending that that's how you discipline your children, but um, it's illustrating exactly what happens during the seven last plagues. The people get so much of what they've chosen ahead of God that it destroys them, literally. Now let's dive into this, Revelation chapter 16. We're going to start looking at all these plagues here together. Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and uh, a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Dear friends, the first plague is going to be a terrible moment on earth. It's going to fall, the Bible says, a foul and loathsome sore. I, I don't know exactly what kind of a sore, but maybe something like bloody boils and blisters all over the human body. And it's going to fall, the Bible says, on everyone who worships the beast. That means anybody who is following any teachings of the Antichrist kingdom in the last days or any worship that's part of the Antichrist kingdom, anything that has to do with it, that this plague is going to fall upon them. And when the first plague falls, try to imagine how hellish it's going to be. On that day, it's not going to matter one bit what your friends or your family or your spouse thought about you or said about you. The only thing that's going to matter is this. Did I obey the word of God? That's the only thing that's going to matter. On that day, it's not going to matter one bit what everybody else in the religious world was doing. The only thing that's going to matter is, did I do what pleased the Lord? It's not going to matter if you believed a certain way all your life long. Only one thing is going to matter. Did I live by the truth of the Bible? That's all that's going to matter. And in that day when this first plague falls, millions of people are going to realize I could have followed the truth. I could have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. But now I'm covered with these boils and bloody blisters all over my body. And I've gotten the first plague. I'm damned forever. And that's going to be a horrible moment, dear friends. Because everybody in the world is going to know at that moment who's saved and who's lost. Everybody. What a horrible moment. And in this first plague, God says, I'm demonstrating one thing to the entire world, that it pays to serve Jesus Christ. And it pays to obey all the truth and the commandments of God. All of you that were sitting on the fence and wanted to follow the traditions and commandments of men and go the way the crowd was going or were too afraid to stand up for Jesus and be counted, it pays to serve God. Now, dear friends, there's something else that God exposes in this first plague because one of the great deceptions before Jesus comes is false miracles and false signs. And I promised you that I would talk about this earlier. So I want to come back to Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. It says this, talking about the second beast with regard to the first beast, he, the second beast, America, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who is wounded by the sword and live. So the Bible says that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. This is one of the great signs. And, 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 and this is so relevant, dear friends, this is scary. 
It's being fulfilled all around us right now in the religious world. A false fire comes from heaven. That's what the Bible says. Dear friends, this is talking about a false Holy Spirit movement. Because in the New Testament, the only fire that ever fell from heaven fell when? On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples. And this, this what Revelation is talking about is he deceives people. So we know this is not a true Holy Spirit movement. We know it's a false Holy Spirit movement. And it deceives people by means of miracles. And this is happening before our eyes throughout the Christian world everywhere we turn. You turn on Christian TV and you have all these televangelists and these faith healers and all kinds of people saying, Ho, ho, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit is coming down. And they're waving their hands and they're jumping around and they're shouting and they're exciting. And, and they're, look at the miracles the Holy Spirit is doing. People are getting healed. People are being raised up. And do you know what? The devil is just dancing with joy as long as one thing happens. People stay in a church with truth and error mixed. Folks, the devil is a faithful churchgoer. He goes to church every week. He knows a lot about it, and he loves for people to go to church as long as it's not teaching all the truth. Now, many of you here may remember uh, a very famous preacher of a couple decades ago by the name of Oral Roberts. He's passed away about a little over 10 years ago now. But um, Oral Roberts, take him for example. What, at the height of his, his ministry and popularity, he was probably the well, most well-known preacher in the United States at the height of his uh, ministry. He claimed to have the gift of healing. And he's doing these miracles, supposedly, and signs and wonders and all these things. And it looks like the Holy Spirit is really blessing and being poured out. But Oral Roberts teaches or taught the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Is that from the Bible or the beast? That's from the beast. Oral Roberts teaches Sunday worship. Is that from the Bible or the beast? It's from the beast. Oral Roberts teaches the immortality of the soul. Is that from the Bible or the beast? It's from the beast. I am so sick at heart over all these false faith healers and leaders who is mis misleading millions of people. Because Oral Roberts, if you remember, he needed $10 million to build a hospital for children. And, and he wasn't getting the money. And I remember hearing this all over the news. And all of a sudden he announced that God told him if he didn't raise $10 million, God was going to take him. And so he was telling everybody, you got to you got to make your donation because God's going to take me by such and such. If you don't, if you don't raise up this $10 million for my hospital for, my, for the kids, hey, if heaven is so great, why, does he, why was he worried about God taking them, huh? That was one question I had. And then, but then get this. Wait a minute. Just think about this. He's building a hospital. If Oral Roberts really has the gift of healing, what do you need $10 million to build a hospital for? For children. What he should be doing is going to all the hospitals that are already built for all the children. He should be going in all the rooms and laying his hands on them and healing them and raising them up in the name of Jesus. If he really has the gift of healing. Some of you might remember hearing a guy by the name of Peter Popoff. He was a hugely popular faith healer. Huge, I mean, he would rent football stadiums, that, you know, baseball stadiums. They'd go fill up these stadiums with 40, 50, 60,000 people. And when the people would come, they would all have to register and write down their name and their address and their sickness or their problem that they wanted to be healed from on a card. And then they would turn all the cards in and, and Peter would be out on the stage and he would get the crowd all worked up and all into an emotional frenzy and he'd be jumping and shouting and raising his hands and hallelujah and hoo -hoo! And, and, and the crowd would just be all full of energy and so excited thinking that the Holy Spirit's poured out. But you know what they did with the cards? They collected all those cards and they sent all the cards to Peter's wife Elizabeth. 
And Peter's wife Elizabeth was in a was in a back room, and she had uh, they had a special radio or transmitter set up in a frequency, and she had a microphone, and she'd be reading through the cards. And Peter's out on the stage, and he has an invisible little earpiece in his ear. And his wife is talking to him in the earpiece, and she's like, okay, Peter, tonight, who, what are we going to heal tonight? What are we going to do? Let me see. I'm looking through the cards. Oh, hey, why don't we do back pain tonight? Sounds like a good one. Okay, so we're going to do back pain, Peter. And Peter's get there, and Peter's on the stage going, oh, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit is talking to me. He's telling me tonight he's going to move. He's going to move tonight. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, what are you going to do tonight? What do you want to heal tonight? What's your move going to be? Oh, you want to touch back pain. You're going to do lower back pain. Thank you, Lord. His wife is talking to him in the earpiece in the ear, telling him what, what, what he's going to do. And so they get all the people worked up. And so then uh, uh, she picks a card out. Oh, there's uh, Tony Jones lives at 1578 uh, Sunset Way. So, so she says, okay, let's, let's do this one. So, so Peter Popov's getting in the spirit and he's jumping around and he's praising the Lord and people are saying, oh, dear friends, anybody here got lower back pain? Now you've got tens of thousands of people in the stadium. And so hands go up all over the place because everybody's got lower back pain almost, right? So, so hands are going up all over the place. And, and he's saying, oh, friends, well, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? Please talk to me. I want to be your servant. I know you got a blessing for somebody special here tonight. Oh, and, and Elizabeth says, Tony, Tony Jones. This is the person, Tony Jones. And, and so he says, is there, is there somebody? I'm just getting an impression. Uh, the Lord is telling me there's a, there's a Tony here tonight with lower back pain. Is there a Tony here tonight with lower back pain? And of course, because there's thousands of people in the auditorium, guess what? Lots of hands. There's several Tonys in the audience. And they go up. And he says, oh, Lord God. But, but look at all these Tonys here. And I know you love them all. But is there one that you want to bless in a special way tonight here? One you want to heal? And his wife says, oh, it's the one. Uh, he lives at 1578 Sunset Way. Oh, is there a Tony here tonight that lives at 1578 Sunset Sunset Way. And Tony, who lives at 1578 Sunset Way, feels like, oh, God has called me. And he jumps to his feet. And he's so excited. And Peter pop up sometimes that your piece would come loose. And so he'd, he'd push on his ear and say, oh, Holy Spirit, it's so loud in here. you got to talk to me, Lord. Speak up a little bit. And he's pushing his earpiece back into his ear. And, and, and so then uh, Peter, Peter sees Tony stand up. He says, Tony, are you the Tony that lives at 1578 Sunset Way? Yes, I am. He said, do you have faith? Do you believe? You believe what God is going to do for you tonight? Yes, I do. Come on down. And Tony comes down to the stage and he comes up and he comes up on the stage and Peter pop up says all right Tony be it unto you according to your faith and he hits him with his hand and Tony gets knocked over on the ground and everybody thinks the Holy Spirit has struck Tony but you know what they found out they found out the radio frequency it was 39.17 megahertz that Elizabeth Peter's wife was talking to him over the transmitter and they also discovered that Peter Popoff had had a special battery pack developed that he wore behind his suit with electrodes that came down his arm and the edge of the electrodes was right here in the sleeve of the suit and when he hit Tony he shocked him with the electricity and that's what knocked Tony over. A total scam folks and I gotta tell you what through this first plague, God exposes all the foolishness and the fakeness and the hypocrisy because a lot of religious people are going to get these boils and blisters and Benny Hinn is not going to be able to heal them. Imagine that you're a Christian and suddenly you wake up and you're covered with this first plague. You've got these bloody boils and blisters all over your body. You run to your pastor and you say, 
How could this happen? I thought I was saved. I was using the name of Jesus. I believed in Jesus. I was going to church every week on Sunday. But I got this first plague. I'm lost. How could that be? And you begged me. And you begged the preacher, please heal me. Do something about it. Take this pain away. And the preacher can't do it because it's God's judgment. And God is going to expose the farce of all that goes on out there in the name of Jesus Christ. God says mercy's door is closed and because you did not obey my word when you had the chance, it's too late. Dear friends, you and I need to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Revelation 16 going on verses 3 through 7. And I saw, oh sorry, I'm in 13. Let's go back to Revelation 16 verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. You see, the second and the third plagues are upon the salt water and the fresh water systems of the entire globe. Why does God send this plague, dear friends? First of all, He sends it because the world mocked the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. And the world laughed at the atonement. And God says, okay, I'm going to show you what you have rejected. But it wasn't enough for them to shed the blood of Jesus. They went on to shed the blood of saints, the Bible says. They went on to shed the blood of martyrs. And God says, I've had enough. It's a violation of my sixth commandment. You shall not kill. And if you love blood so much, you can have it. Furthermore, dear friends, you and I tonight live in a bloodthirsty, blood-crazed, blood-obsessed society. We watch a movie where a man takes out a gun and blows another man's head away, and we think it's great entertainment. We kind of enjoy it. We live in a society where millions of babies a year are sucked out of their mother's wombs, and the blood is flowing across the land, and God says, I've had enough. If you want blood, you're going to get all the blood that there is. Here it is. You can drink blood. You can choke on the blood. Uh, it behooves us, dear friends, to respect the sanctity of life. Amen. But for God's people, Isaiah 33 and verse 16 says, Our bread and our water will be sure. I want to be on God's side. How about you? Amen. The next plague, it deals specifically with pagan sun worship. Verse 8, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Where else did we read about that repenting and giving God glory? We read it earlier tonight in Revelation 14, verse 7, in the... First angel's warning message. Fear God and give glory to Him. You see, ever since the beginning of time, men have worshipped in honor of the pagan sun god. All throughout the Bible, God was trying to break this behavior even among His people. From Babylon's uh, clear sacrificial and pagan worship system all the way clear down to today's Christian veneered Sunday Men have disregarded the clearest truths of God's Word. And God is saying that you have chosen to worship the Son instead of giving honor to Jesus Christ. And while they're doing it, they say, oh, I want to give honor to the resurrection. Dear friends, to honor Jesus is to obey Him. That's why the prophet said to obey is better than sacrifice. God says, I'm tired of it. I've tried. I wrote my Ten Commandments 
I gave them to you crystal clear. I told you how to worship me. I sent my son. I sent my last day warning message to the world. And if you love the son so much and you refuse to listen to all the appeals I've made to you and you want to give honor, and respect and glory to that pagan image rather than to me by obeying my law, then you're going to get all the sun that you want and more. It's going to scorch you with fire. The God that you've chosen ahead of me is going to burn you up. The amazing thing is, even when the sun God is burning men with fire, dear friends, the Bible says they still don't repent and give God glory. Do you know why they don't? It's too late. Mercy's door is closed. God wants us to realize there is a serious penalty for not going all the way with truth and with Jesus. May this message so convict our hearts tonight that we say, all to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. Dear friends, I don't enjoy preaching this. I wish I didn't have to. I wish it wasn't in the Bible, but it is. And so I have to be faithful to all the truth of the Bible. And I can't skip over it. So I have to share it with you so that you understand the issues. Now the fifth plague is especially for the Vatican. Chapter 16 and verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. The fifth plague is a plague of darkness. Why? Why is it a plague of darkness? It's because the Bible says men love what? Darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. As men rejected the light from God's word, as they refused to walk in the truth that God brought to their, their minds and their hearts, he says, okay, if you'd rather have darkness than the light of my truth and the light from God's word, then all right, you are going to walk in darkness. And the darkness is you're going to get more than you could ever imagine. And the darkness is going to be so intense, it's going to be so severe, it's going to be so claustrophobic that you will literally gnaw the tongue right out of your mouth. It's why God says, walk while you have the light, or else the light will turn to darkness. If you've learned any light, dear friends, during this seminar, now is the time to walk in that light. Now is the time to do it and not delay, because if you delay, the light will turn to darkness. And someday, it's going to be so gross, it's going to be so intense, it's going to be so claustrophobic, that you will literally chew the tongue right out of your head. Powerful things. Powerful things. The sixth plague. Plague of Armageddon. Verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and his water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they had the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief, Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Now I'm going to stop right there for just a moment, dear friends. God here, in the middle of talking about the sixth plague, the battle of Armageddon, he interjects like a thought that doesn't even seem to belong there, right in verse 15. In the clear, out of the clear blue, in the middle of this plague, he says, hey, I hope you're prepared because I am coming quickly. I'm coming quickly, he says. And this is very interesting, dear friends. When we were studying about the rapture, most Christians today are being taught that the, the Antichrist is going to come and, and then the time of great tribulation, but the church is already raptured. The church is already gone before all of this, right? That's the typical belief. But obviously that can't be true at all because right here in Revelation, we're reading right here in the middle of the sixth plague, Jesus says, be ready, I'm coming quickly. 
He couldn't have raptured his people before this because he's telling you in this plague, I'm still coming. This alone tells us, dear friends, that the whole idea of a pre-tribulation rapture cannot possibly be true because still at this point in the plagues, God's people are still here. And he says, I'm coming quickly. Now let's look at verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So here's the typical Christian belief and teaching on this matter. They say that literal Israel over there in Palestine is going to have a huge battle that's going to be fought in this little valley called the Valley of Megiddo. And they refer to that battle as Armageddon. And they say that during this battle, which is going to be nuclear holocaust, Israel is going to be delivered by some country who's coming from the east. And most people say, well, that's the United States coming to deliver Israel, and after this great battle is fought, Israel is set free, and it enjoys a millennium of peace, and so on and so forth. That's the popular teaching. Now, I don't doubt that quite possibly at some point there may be some sort of battle fought in the Valley of Megiddo. I believe it's very likely. You know why I think that's possible? Because the devil is so smart, he's smart enough to do it to sidetrack the entire world, because he's already developed this whole web of lies and deceit concerning it. But you're going to find out tonight as we look at God's Word that the issues are far bigger, far broader than any battle that might occur in the Middle East. That, and, and here's one principle that I want you to learn that, that I help, want you to understand about a, a prophecy in, in the book of Revelation. What was literal and local in the Old Testament becomes global and spiritual in the New Testament. And I want to show you how this works with Revelation. If you look at ancient Israel, in Jeremiah, it tells you there, number one up on the screen there, uh, it, it was persecuted by Babylon. And if you read Revelation 17, it also tells us that spiritual Israel is persecuted by Babylon. And so literal and local in the Old Testament, spiritual and global in Revelation. And that's what happens. The parallels are all there. Literal Israel in Daniel 3 was forced to worship an image. In, in Revelation 13, spiritual Israel is forced to worship an image. Then in Daniel 4, it talks about the, the, the city was called Babylon the Great, literal Babylon, Babylon the Great. In Revelation 17, spiritual Babylon is called Babylon the Great. And so you, I'm not going to take the time to go through, but what I'm trying to show you is that what was literal and local in the Old Testament becomes global and spiritual in the New Testament. And that principle applies very clearly to the Battle of Armageddon. So I want to go back here to verse 14, and it says uh, something very interesting here. They are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. First question, how much of the world is involved in the battle of Armageddon? All the world, the entire world, it says, is involved in the Battle of Armageddon. Next question. Can you fit the population of the whole world in the little valley of Megiddo, yes or no? No, no you can't. You can't even fit the population of New York City in that valley. I've been there. I have visited it in my studies to try to understand the Word of God. And it's not a very big valley. It's just a little valley. So how can everybody say, oh, this great, huge, worldwide battle is going to be fought over in this little valley? You see, when God says the whole world, uh, uh, how are you even, I mean, think about it, if they're saying the whole world, how are you even going to get the whole world over there? Is everybody going to wake up in Africa one day and down in Australia one day and in South America and, and all around the world in Europe and Asia and, and all these different countries in the world say, hey everybody, today is the battle. It's the day for the battle of Armageddon to begin and we got to go, let's get in our jumble jets and let's fly over there to Megiddo so that we can be in the valley of Megiddo for the battle of Armageddon. Is that what's going to happen? No, that doesn't make any sense. There's a cosmic picture taking place here because every man, woman, and child on earth is involved in the battle of Armageddon. Third question, where is or what is this place that's called Armageddon? Verse 16 is so crucial to this. It's so important. 
Look at what it says. And they gathered them together to the place called in what language? Hebrew, Armageddon. Now here's what almost everybody overlooks on this subject of the battle of Armageddon. Don't miss it. John is writing the book of Revelation in what language? He's writing it in Greek. It's the New Testament. He's writing it in Greek. John is having a vision. He's describing what he sees in vision, and suddenly he can't find the Greek word. It doesn't exist. And so he switches back to the Old Testament, which was written in what language? Hebrew, that's right. He can't find the Greek word, so he reverts to Hebrew and says it was called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now the key question, and this is the one that most people overlook when they're writing books uh, about Armageddon, they willfully overlook it. The question is this, what is actually the word Armageddon in Hebrew? When you study this out, you find out that the only word that comes close to approximating that in Hebrew is the word that you see on the screen, Har Moed. That's the Hebrew word for Armageddon. And it literally means the Mount of the Congregation or Mount Zion. That is the Hebrew definition of that word, Har Moed, which is the Hebrew word for Armageddon. So John, dear friends, he's not even talking about the little valley of Megiddo over there in the Middle East. He specifically says it's called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, which is Har Moed. And that's the word that I want you to understand, Har Moed, Mount of the Congregation. By the way, go with me to Isaiah. That's where God's throne is. When you study the Mount of the Congregation out throughout the Bible, you find out that this is where God's throne is. This is where God's dwelling place is. It's the seat of his authority and power. And this is what Satan is trying to attack. And so now we're going to get the big picture. And, and uh, now we're going to see what the true Armageddon is. Because Lucifer wanted to take God's throne and rule the universe, didn't he? Yeah. Look at Isaiah 14 and verse 13. This is talking about Lucifer, and it says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. But notice back there in verse 13, right in the kind of the middle, I will also sit where? On the mount of the congregation, I will sit on Har Moed. Armageddon. You see, this, dear friends, is what the battle is over. God's throne, not oil. That is not the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is God's throne. Satan said he would be like God. Satan said he would take God's place on the throne. Satan has always had an obsession to rule the universe forever and for eternity. And he says that he's going to be the one to sit on the mount of the congregation, Armageddon. That's God's throne, friends. And whoever sits on God's throne is the one to be worshipped. The final showdown between God and Satan is the battle of Armageddon, and it's over who gets to rule the universe and be worshipped by all creation. That's what the real issue of Armageddon is. Who are you worshipping? God or Satan? That's what this war is all about. Because Satan wants you to worship him instead of God. And so he developed the whole false religious system in Babylon with the sun worship and all the things and the counterfeit day of worship. And it found its way all the way down into papal Rome and from there into the rest of Christianity. That's Armageddon, dear friend. It has nothing to do with the little valley in Israel. It has nothing to do with oil. It's a cosmic battle over God's throne. Who's going to sit on God's throne? Who's going to be worshipped? Now, don't miss this. Let's go back to Revelation 13, uh, 16. And I want to look at verse 13 uh, with you here. Don't miss this. Because this is so awesome. On God's side of the battle, there is the Godhead, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But whatever God has, Satan has a what? Counterfeit. counterfeit. I want you to notice Satan's counterfeit trinity in verse 13. And I saw 
three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, number one, out of the mouth of the beast, number two, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, number three. There are three counterfeits here to the Trinity, and I want to show you the relationship between them. Right up there, is, we know that the dragon is Satan, and he wants to sit on God's throne. That's what we just read. So therefore, the counterfeit for God the Father is Satan the dragon, right? And then, second of all, we have the beast. And the beast is called anti-who? Christ. Christ. And so the beast is the counterfeit for Christ, God's Son, God the Son. Did you know, by the way, that everything that Jesus is called in the Bible, the beast power calls itself? All of Jesus' uh, teachings, the Vatican has changed them, corrupted them. And so the Antichrist, just like Satan the dragon is trying to take the place of God the Father on his throne, the Antichrist beast, the Vatican, is trying to take the place of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Then third of all, we have the false prophet, and the false prophet replaces the Holy Spirit, because John 16 says the Holy Spirit doesn't speak his own words, but whatever he hears from the Father and the Son, that's what he speaks, right? He's the representative of the Father and the Son, and so he represents them. And so the counterfeit, dear friends, is the false prophet who speaks the words of Satan, the dragon, and the words of the Antichrist beast, the Vatican. The false prophet, dear friends, then, is all, are all the other churches with a mixture of truth and error who keep teaching things from the Antichrist, like Sunday, pre-tribulation rapture, immortal soul, eternally burning hellfire, all these false doctrines, because they are speaking for the beast, and they're getting the world to really worship and follow the beast. That's why 1 John chapter 4 says to test the spirits, because many false prophets have gone out into our world. And how many false prophets are there speaking for the beast, and teaching the beast false doctrines to the whole world tonight. Now I want to look at verse 17. Then the angel poured out his bowl onto, uh, then the angel, seventh angel, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. So, who is, notice, the devil is trying to take over God's throne. We just read in verse 17, who's still on the throne? God is still on the throne. That's exactly right. I love it. Here's the old devil. He's saying, I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to be on the farthest side there. I'm going to be on the mount of the congregation. I'm going to be like the Most High. And he doesn't end up there. He ends up in hell. And the beast ends up in hell. And the false prophet ends up in hell. And God is still on his throne. Hallelujah. I love it. It's awesome. And, and what is the outcome? Let's turn over for a minute to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Then his eyes were like the, uh, a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one uh, could uh, knew except himself. He was clothed with a, wet, with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Then drop down to verse 19 with me. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who... Um, who worked signs in his presence by uh, which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake burning with fire and uh, burning with brimstone. Uh, the, lake, the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the white horse, uh, on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And so 
so what it's telling us, dear friends, this is the wrap-up of the battle of Armageddon. Jesus Christ is coming in power and great glory to overthrow evil and to claim his throne. And then by the time you get back to uh, chapter 16 and verse 18, it carries on with the description of, of all that's happening. And, and he's coming to king, and it says there in verse 18, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. And now the great city was divided into three parts, and the city of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hail about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since, the plague, um, since that plague was exceedingly great. Oh, dear friends, it's all over now by the time we get to the end of Armageddon. Jesus is coming in power and great glory. And the cities are wiped away, the Bible says. Dynasties crumble and are crushed. And hail comes down from God out of heaven. 75 pounds apiece. That's how much a talent weighs. Can you imagine hailstones that weigh 75 pounds hitting this planet? Can you imagine what it would do hitting this building? It's just going to blow things apart. It's just going to crush everything. I don't know about you tonight, but I for sure want to be on God's side. Amen. After this message, there's no doubt I want to be on God's side. Sometimes people say, Byron, it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to keep the commandments. It's hard to obey Bible truth. Dear friends, you're thinking about it all wrong. It's not hard. It's easy. The Bible says the way of the sinner is what's hard. Think about that for a minute, the way of the sinner. You see, what's hard, folks, is the first plague. Your body is covered with boils and blisters, oozing, pus and blood. And you can't lie down and you scream in pain. You can't sit down and you scream in pain. You can't even stand up because you're in unspeakable pain with all these bloody boils and sores all over your body, screaming in your passion, wanting to die. Folks, that's what's hard. God's people walking around in the picture of perfect health, praising God. Ha, that's easy. Then think about it. The plague of blood. The wicked try to take a shower. Blood comes up. They try to get a drink. Blood comes up. And with throats parched with thirst and bodies reeking of filth, they wander over this earth wishing to God that they had decided to follow the truth. God's people, the Bible says, our bread and water will be sure. That's easy. That's not hard. That's easy. And then, the plague of the sun. I've burned myself a time or two with the sun. Have you? And let me tell you what. Burns are painful. It's agonizing when you burn. You know, I've burned myself so bad, you know, you had all those little little bumps on your skin where the skin separated and filled up with water. Oh, it's just terrible. Terrible. And the wicked are burned and they are scorched with their sun god and, and their flesh blisters and rots away and drops off and, and with pain that's literally indescribable. They wish to God that they had obeyed the truth. But while they are being burned with their sun god, God's, uh, that, that's what's hard for the wicked. But while they're being burned with their sun god, God's people... We pull out a lawn chair, put on some copper tone, and relax. Catch a few rays and enjoy the sunshine. That's easy, amen? That's what's easy. And then next, the plague of darkness comes. The darkness so intense, so suffocating, so choking. The Bible says people chew the tongue right out of their mouths. That's what's hard. But God's people walking in the light of God's truth and love and grace, that's easy, dear friends. And then the battle takes place. I don't know about you, but I hate being a loser. That's why it's hard sometimes, isn't it? To be like a Seahawks fan or a Rangers fan or a Texans fan. Sometimes it's hard. I think the last thing on that day that I want to find out is that I'm a loser, dear friends. I want to be a winner on that day. Amen? I want to be crossing the finish line. And the majority who thought that sin was great.
great and the traditions were wonderful and the popular Christianity was fine and that doing everything that anybody else on the broad road to hell was doing was okay, suddenly realized I have not walked in the light and I have not been sealed by the Holy Spirit and hail begins to come down from heaven and polarizes them and, and, and while the hail falls and the earth is shaken and they are hopelessly lost, they finally realize that they have forfeited it all. That's hard. But God's people, what do we do? We look up and we see our Lord and our Savior coming and we hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the joy of your Lord. And while the pulverizing hail is coming down, destroying this earth, we are going up to glory. Dear friends, that's easy. Amen. I want to be there, don't you? If you haven't already, won't you make the decision tonight to say, yes, Lord, nothing is going to keep me back from the truth. Nothing is going to stop me from making the decision that I need to and that you're convicting me of. Won't you do that this evening, dear friends? And I just want to, I can't help but wrap this up with one final appeal. Please, I invite you to take out those cards that you received when you came in tonight. And I'm pleading, I'm praying in, in the depths of my heart that you will respond to the Holy Spirit, that you won't compromise, and, and, and that you will read this. So I'm going to put some responses on the screen. And please, just take a moment to fill this card out, and then I need Jordan to get those baskets and put them up here at the front for us. Number one, I want God's truth to protect me from the end time judgments. Dear friends, these seven last plagues are very real. And they are coming upon an unrepentant world. And I want to appeal to you tonight, if you really in the heart of hearts want to make the commitment that you want God's truth to protect you from the end time judgments, go ahead and put a check mark in box number one. And then number two, I commit my life to Jesus 100% above family, friends, churches, or anything. I know this may seem like a hard question, but friends, I realized a long time ago in my life that my dad couldn't save me, my mom couldn't save me, my wife couldn't save me, nobody could save me. It's only my individual choice with Jesus alone. And that there's no human on this earth that has any right to put any pressure on us concerning what the Holy Spirit is telling us as individuals in our heart of hearts. And we should never bow for any individual concerning what they may be uh, putting upon us in that way. We answer to Jesus and to Jesus alone. And we should pray for that other individual, our, our family member. But we should continue loving them. We should continue being patient. And we should pray for them. But we got to trust them to God. And we need to do what God is calling us to do. Question uh, number three response. I choose to keep the Sabbath, trusting God to care for my needs. If you want to put your trust in God and see what a mighty God He is, you want to walk in this light that God has revealed to you from His Word, put a check mark in box number three. I want to follow Jesus in baptism or rebaptism. I can never pass an opportunity to give you to give you a chance to go all the way with Jesus, to make sure that He's your Lord and Savior, that your past is washed away, and that you stand as a new creation in Jesus. And then the last, uh, the last response is inviting you once more to become part of a Sabbath-keeping movement, God's visible remnant on earth, the Adventist Church. Put a check mark in box number five. You might not be ready quite to do that right away, but it's a journey. Just put a check there and we'll, we'll talk with you. We'll help you take those steps as time is right and so on. And so then fill out your name and address, bring the cards up here, and drop them in the baskets as I pray.
we have spoken this evening of one of the most difficult subjects in your word, that of the seven last plagues and the implications and the ramifications because they come upon an unrepentant world, a world that has resisted your pleas of mercy, your pleas of grace, and your appeals to walk in the light of truth. Until finally, Lord, there is no remedy, and you must allow sinners to have what they have chosen above you to the point where it comes to their destruction, because that's what the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. And so, Heavenly Father, tonight I pray that we have heard the seriousness of these things, but that we've not missed the hope and the message that it's never too late, and that your spirit is lingering to call us, and that you are a God of love who does not want to pour out judgments, but you are also just and you must cleanse the world from sin. But before you do that, you send warnings and you plead with people in your love that they might be saved and they might be spared. And so, Lord, tonight I pray that each and every one of us here will hear you pleading with us and respond to us in the way that, and respond, that we will respond to you in the way that the Holy Spirit is impressing upon our hearts. And I pray that you will pursue us, God, that you will give us discernment and clarity of thought and mind, and that we will choose to lay everything down for our wonderful Lord and Savior. I pray that you comfort and encourage every heart here in this place to know that no matter what the burden or challenge, you are able, just as you parted the waters of the Red Sea to bring your people through, you can part the waters of difficulty in our lives and bring us through. And so I thank you for that now, and I thank you for the awesome love and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep us near your heart and pray in Jesus' name. We know that we can't have all the good without the bad, right? So there are mansions in heaven waiting for us. We know that there's going to be some things going on for those that are not going, right? So we do have time. We have some work to do. And we pray that those of you that are here that need to make decisions, you'll make those decisions and make them quickly. That is our prayer. Brother Jordan, will you come up here with me, please? Hey, don't pick Byron's name. Picky. You already have this, right? Yes, I And you and you have and you have a coordinate center. I think he's got it all. <laughs> Crystal Smith. minute break get up and stretch uh, fill out your registration cards for one more time because we're going to do one more drawing give away some more gifts and then at seven o'clock we'll come back for our second session our wrap-up session of the evening uh, harps and halos the truth about heaven <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Besides single, what kind of a man was Boaz before he got married? <laughs> yeah, you're 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 too you're too accurate, Roosevelt. He was he was ruthless. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. All right. Next question. Who was the greatest financier in the Bible? The greatest financier in the Bible. Well, it was Noah. Because he was floating his stock while the rest of the world was in liquidation. <laughs> so that was the greatest male financier. Who's the greatest female financier in the Bible? Yeah, that's, that's too biblical. <laughs> the greatest female financier was Pharaoh's daughter because she went down to the bank of the Nile and drew out a little profit. I know you guys are going to th start throwing tomatoes or something, right? You're saying, Byron, you got, you got to keep your real job, man. Don't, don't go into this. Um, well, who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? The greatest comedian in the Bible. Who was it? No. It was Samson. He brought the house down. Now, who was the greatest babysitter in the Bible? The greatest babysitter in the Bible. Well, it was David because he rocked Goliath into a very deep sleep. And, <laughs> yeah, I hear the booze coming, yeah. Which, uh, which, which person in the Bible had no parents? Somebody surely has to be able to get this one. Yes, thank you, Hugh. Joshua, the son of Nun. <laughs> Who was the shortest man in the Bible? <laughs> no, it wasn't Zacchaeus. There's kind of a debate between whether it was Nehemiah or whether it was Bildad the Shuhite. <laughs> if you don't believe me about Bildad the Shuhite, he's in Job. He, you find him there, yeah. Uh, and, and then um, maybe I'll ask one more question. You should be able to get this one too. What is the first car mentioned in the Bible? Accord. Yes, it's an axe. They were all in one accord. Okay, 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 I get it. You want me to... <laughs> yeah, Alex, he's shaking his head in here. Yeah, you're you're you you're, you're done, man. You you just need to sit down and be finished. Okay, well let's uh, let's have prayer. Thank you for indulging me some of those questions. I'm glad to see that your biblical knowledge is is so well that you couldn't figure any of those out. That's 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 a good thing, right? Okay, let's let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so very much this evening for the wonderful, wonderful promise of the return of Jesus to this earth. A king who's going to come and who's going to clean up this mess of sin and create a new heaven and a new earth. And oh Lord, I pray that tonight, no matter what we may be going through, we may be encouraged as we take a little glimpse of that home that you're preparing for us. May it encourage us. May it fill us with hope. May it fill us with the determination to not let anything prevent us from being there. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit will once more bless us and speak to us through your word and help us to see our Lord and Savior Jesus and his great plans for us a little more clearly is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our subject for this session is entitled Harps and Halos, The Truth About Heaven. Have you ever wished for a better place? 
There can be no denying the fact that we live here, but we don't have the ultimate life. We love here, but we don't have permanent love. We laugh, but we don't have lasting happiness because this world is so sin broken. Everything is tainted with that sinful, sinful Paul. It is true, though, that God gives the Christian faith. He gives the Christian the ability to have faith in a faithless world and to have light in a dark world and to, have, and to find good in a world that's filled with tragedy and evil and to find happiness in a world of unhappiness and to find peace that's in a world of panic and to find love in a world filled with lust. It's true that God gives the ability to the Christian to live, for, uh, to live from day to day with hope. And uh, let's go in our Bibles to John. I want to begin picking up and getting a picture here of these promises in John chapter 14. Uh, because God does something special for the believer. And, and he has and she has something inside of us that keeps us going. But if all that we are living for is for today, is for this life, then we are of all people most miserable. Because the ultimate life, the ultimate love, and the ultimate fulfillment, the ultimate happiness for the believer is heaven. Amen. You see, from Genesis to Revelation, God's purpose for His children has always been the same. To restore the kingdom of God to the people of God. Amen. That is why what Jesus said about heaven matters for us. That's why what John the Revelator said about heaven matters. That's why what the prophets said about heaven matters for us tonight. Because everywhere you go through, through the Bible, it assumes that there's a heaven. It doesn't go into elaborate lengths to try to prove it or demonstrate it, empiri it empirically. Just chapter after chapter, book after book, talks about the existence of heaven and just states the fact of it. And Jesus gave us one of the most beautiful and comforting promises here in John 14, starting in verse 1. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> you believe in God, believe also in me. You know, Jesus is saying, in a troubled world, don't you be troubled by it. In a perplexing world, don't you be perplexed by it. In a messed up world, don't let that mess up your life. In a discouraging world, don't you be discouraged by it. Don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because you believe in God. It's all right for the unbeliever. It's all right for, for a heathen, for a person out there in the world who doesn't know God. It's okay for them to be troubled. They ought to be troubled. But you, you believe in God. You believe in me. So don't let your heart be troubled. Because I have a plan, he says. In my Father's house, verse 2, are many mansions. If it were not so... I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, one of the most glorious promises in all of Scripture. The Bible is really telling us that this world is not our home, dear friends. We have a better one, a better home that Jesus is preparing for us. I remember coming across a story about a, a, a guy by the name of Bob Harrington. Years ago, he was known as the chaplain of Bourbon Street there in New Orleans. And uh, he was one day he was walking along Bourbon Street. Where else would you expect him to be walking, right? And um, uh, he had a Bible under his arm, and he was kind of humming a bit of a hymn there as he was walking along just enjoying the day. And uh, there happened to be a bartender outside his bar that morning. What else would you expect to be on Bourbon Street, right? A bar. And so he was cleaning up after the night's activities and sweeping around. And he saw Bob coming walking down the street. And, uh, and so he said, hey, Bob. He said, where are you going? And without missing a beat, Bob said, heaven, just passing through town. And isn't that a wonderful sentiment? It's true because we really are pilgrims here, you and I. That's why uh, uh, Abraham, that's why the Bible tells us in Hebrews that Abraham sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Hebrews 11 and verse 9. I'm talking about Abraham. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Now notice this is talking about the land of promise. But it says that he lived there as in a foreign country, 
dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Drop down to verse 16. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so once again, the Bible emphasizes that we are pilgrims here, you and I. Our home is to come. It's the kingdom of, of our God that he's preparing for us. We are really like Bob. We should just be passing through town. Amen? Amen. The problem is with all too many of us, we forget because we don't see the unseen realities of the world that God's making for us. We forget about it. And all too many of us, we forget that we're passing through and we want to get all comfortable and stay and, and we want to take up residence in the penthouse suite, you know. We forget that we're aliens and we want to get citizenship here on this earth. And by the way, I know a little bit about citizenship because I am not a, uh, a U.S. citizen. I'm a Canadian citizen. And so if you guys ever, when the Bible talks about being aliens, I understand what that is. And if you guys ever wanted to know what an alien looks like, now you've seen them. You know, a little green man with funny eyes or whatever, right? And things stick. Because I am what they call a resident alien. I have a card. They call it a green card. It's actually not green. But um, it says on that card, resident alien. So, now you've met an alien. <laughs> and you said, oh, now I understand. What's wrong with you, Byron, right? <laughs> okay. but, but, uh, but I tell you that because really, dear friends, all of us should have citizenship in God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. We want to be citizens of heaven. And so I want to, though, begin to get a picture here in Revelation chapter 21 of this city that Hebrews referred to that Abraham was looking for. The city whose builder and maker is God. The city that has foundations. Revelation 21, and we're going to start reading here in verse 10. And the Bible says, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, the, uh, she had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels, the gates and names written on them, which are the the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Let's stop there for just a moment. John tells us that he sees the new Jerusalem. like ray, It's radiant with light. And it's, it's like the light is shining out through crystal. And he says it has high walls on each side. And that there's three gates in each wall. And later on it tells us in verse 21 that, that the, the gates are all made of pearl. They're all of, of solid pearl. And it tells us that the streets are streets of gold. <laughs> Look at verse 16 now. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with reed, uh, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Now, we always think of cities in two dimensions, friends, right? Length and breadth. But the Bible very clearly says that this city's length and breadth and height are all equal. And so really, you might conceive of this city as actually being a pyramid. And, and think about it. It's a pyramid and it climaxes at the pinnacle of that city is guess who? God. The throne of God. The presence of God. And, and the angel measured the city and it said it was 12,000 furlongs all the way around it. So that would be the equivalent of 1,500 miles. And so that means it's 375 miles on a side and it's also 375 miles high. Now, all of you geography buffs, what state is that that's kind of highlighted there? That's the state of Colorado, that's right. So, um, what's interesting is, since the New Jerusalem is 375 miles on a side, it's approximately the size of the state of Colorado. The whole city, it's one city, size of the whole state of Colorado, plus it's 375 miles high as well. Now, let's keep reading here, verse 17 and 18. 
Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. And the, the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was of pure gold, like clear glass. And then the foundations of the wall, and I won't take the time to read them all, but it has 12 foundations, the Bible tells us there. And, and it, those 12 foundations are all these different gemstones, and the colors of the stones are arranged in the color of the rainbow. Isn't that interesting? And then that's the 12 foundations, the colors of a rainbow. Let's read verse 22 and following. The, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor to it. And I want to look at verse 25. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. What a wonderful place when you stop to think about it. A city where you don't have to shut the gates. Because there's not going to be any crime, there's not going to be any, any uh, violence, any of those kinds of things. I want you to imagine a world with no garbage, no toxic waste dumps, no landfills, no sewage entering the oceans, no litter. Imagine a world, a city where there's no slums and no housing ghettos and tenements. And I have seen these places where I have traveled around this world. I've seen the open sewers. I've seen the disease, I've seen the sickness, I've seen lepers lying in the ditch of an open sewer. Sad, sad, sad. Imagine a world where there's no starving babies with swollen bellies but empty tummies. No hungry people in the world. A world where there's enough for everyone. Imagine the world that we live in and imagine what heaven is going to be like. I'm so excited for it. Let's look at Revelation 22, uh, verses 1 to 5. Just turn over the page. And the Bible says that he showed me a river, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh, and, of the Lamb. and in the midst of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding his fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. His, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. They have no need of lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What a place! What a great city to live in. I, I know it's hard for us to think about and we can't really imagine it because uh, we've not experienced anything like this. And most of the things that we can imagine are things that we have experienced. But just because it's hard to conceive of it doesn't mean that it's not real. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because God does all kinds of things that we can't even conceive of. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 65 as we continue getting uh, a little bit more insight into God's plans for this wonderful place. The prophets speak a lot about heaven. They say it's a real place for real people and they talk about a new earth and they talk about a new city and they talk about a new beginning and Isaiah says here in chapter 65 and verse 17 for behold I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered or come into mind. God will make this old world so new that it will that, that it's not going to be remembered what it was like before or come into mind. That's what the Bible says. And there's something about getting something new, isn't there? Don't we all love it when we get something new? You just think about getting some. I remember when I was a little boy, I used to have hand me down. Now, I'm not talking about hand-me-down Porsches. That would be okay. I could get used to that. I'm talking about hand-me-down clothes. And I, because I grew up in a family of five kids, and uh, my dad was just starting out a business, and, and times were tight. 
not a lot of money in the bank. I know there were there were weeks and months when when in order to make the salary for his employees, dad didn't pay himself, and so it was kind of uh, kind of tight. And so we we were pinching the pennies, and so we had hand me downs in my family, and uh, we I, I understand all about those things. And um, when we would get something new, it was a great major event. There's something about getting something new, isn't there? And you see, I was the oldest kid in the family, and so you would, you know, I handed my clothing down to my brothers, not my sisters, but to my brothers. And, and you would think that me being the oldest, that I would have to get the new stuff, that I wouldn't have to deal with hand-me-downs. But no way. It was worse for me, because I wore hand-me-downs from my uncles. Things that were already 15 or 20 years old. They were so outdated, they were almost updated, right? Because you know how that goes, right? You just give it 20 years and it's going to be back in style. Maybe they'll call it a different name. Oh, no, back in the 70s, they called them bell bottoms. And then in the 90s, they called them flare, right? So whatever. It's all, they were, but they weren't quite updated. I, I wasn't quite there yet. And, and my mom didn't tell me any different. And so I was wearing my uncle's hand-me-downs. And my mom didn't tell me any different. And so when, when I went to school, my friends looked at me kind of strangely, you know, and kind of pointed and whispered. I thought they were jealous of my hand-me-downs, you know, my uncle's hand-me-downs. Somehow my mom had made me think it was cool. Yeah. It was special to get to wear my uncle's hand-me-downs. And, and, and so, I mean, you know, if you could wear hand-me-downs, you had it made. I wore holy jeans when it wasn't chic. I mean, when I was a kid, you had holy jeans, you put patches on them. Now you get jeans without holes and you rip holes in them. Yeah. Or you pay 150 bucks for jeans that have holes in them already on the shelf. Yeah. I don't get it. I mean, I don't understand it. But anyway, <laughs> well, we can't make up our minds. But there's something about getting something new, isn't there, folks? One day, my mom decided that I needed a new suit to go to church with. That was in the days of the Sears catalogs. Anybody here remember those days? <laughs> I got some friends, right? Oh, that Sears catalog. I remember with the Sears catalog, Christmas time, right? <laughs> Sitting down and going through, and but my parents were like, okay, you can maybe like pick two things. I had two things on every page, you know. Uh, but then mom handed me the Sears catalog and she said, son, you can go to the suit pe uh, section and you can pick out your suit that you want. I'm going to get to pick my suit that I want? There's something about getting something new, isn't there, friends? Oh, it's a wonderful thing. And so I went through the suit section and finally I settled on the suit that I wanted. It was a light tan polyester suit. Mm -hmm. Mom looked at it and she said, son... Are you sure that's the one you want? Because she was thinking about the little country church that we went to with the big field next door and the dandelions and the trees to climb and about little boys going and getting grass stains on light tan polyester suits, right? And she said, son, are you sure that's the one you want? But I was sure and she promised and so we ordered the suit. And, and in my town there wasn't a Sears store but they had a little depot where the packages would come and get dropped off. And so every day I'm like, Mom, did it get here yet? Did it get here yet? Because there's something about getting something new, isn't there, friends? And finally the day came when she said, yeah, they phoned, and your suit's there at the depot. Oh, so we piled into the, into the family vehicle. We went down to Sears, and we got the suit from the store, and I was opening the box before we were back in the vehicle, right? And I was so excited. And then, my goodness, when the day came to get ready to go to church, I was the first one dressed, and I was waiting at the front door. Go, come on, let's go, because I had to get to church, show off my new suit. And when we got to church, I marched in the door, and I came down the aisle, didn't sit in no back seat. I marched myself all the way right down to the front, sat right down there in front of the preacher. And, all right, preacher, you check out my new suit. Preacher, right? <laughs> There's something about getting something new, isn't there, folks? Oh, and if, it's, and if heaven is going to be anything like that feeling of getting something new, it's going to be an awesome feeling, isn't it, my dear friends? But let's go in our Bibles here to uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5, because the Bible says he's going to make all things new. 
And if it feels like that, it's going to be a wonderful thing. All things new, the Bible says, a world marred by sin made new again, a body shattered by disease made new again, a home desecrated and broken made new again, a life ruined and scarred made new again. Amen. Revelation 21 and verse 5, the Bible, we think, I think we read it already once, but I just want to reemphasize it here once more. It says, uh, he, all, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things, what? New. And then it says, and he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And when the Bible says it's true and faithful, I know he's speaking the truth. And I know he's going to be faithful. Because he said, I make all things new. And I believe with all my heart that he's going to do that. You see, dear friends, every page of the newspaper tumbles out sorrow. Every television newscast dramatizes suffering and crime, but not for much longer. The heartache and the sickness and the death of this old world will be no more eradicated from the universe by our marvelous and by our loving, awesome God and everything made new. Because you see, just as there had to be a cross on Golgotha's hill to end sin in the human heart, so there must be another divine event to end sin in the universe, a cross for a new heart, a coming Christ for a new world. No matter what you hear, the Bible says the time is coming when sin will be no more, and it's not going to be much longer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. I love the promises of Scripture concerning this awesome event. And it says here, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Dear friends, he says we're going to be changed, right? And he, he goes on to say in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. And what I love about this passage, he says we're going to be changed if we didn't die. And if we did, we're going to be resurrected, already changed. But changed, new bodies. Woo! That's a day a lot of us here tonight are sure looking forward to, right? A new body. The one you got's got some cranks, right? And some aches and some pains. And I mean, you know, because some of us are suffering from furniture's disease, right? That's when your chest drops into your drawers. And, and then others of us are, are suffering from metallicitis. Because that's when you got silver in your hair and gold in your teeth and lead in your feet. You know, so we're looking forward to that new body, right? When I can look in the mirror and not get a shock. Oh, dear friends, swiftly comes the time when sin and sickness, death and sorrow will be no longer. The remnants of this old world are going to disappear and he's going to start again. Can you imagine about heaven? Death change to life, the Bible says. So many of our loved ones that we've laid to rest, you know? You're thinking of someone right now. I'm thinking of my grandparents. We've all laid loved ones to rest, but the Bible tells us that God is going to change all of that. Mother, you may have laid to rest your baby but you're going to have the privilege of taking that baby in your arms again. And, 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 you know, husband, you may have laid to rest a wife, or wife, you may have laid to rest a husband, but you're going to have the privilege of being reunited with them. Maybe there's some Christian couples that have never had the opportunity or the ability to have a child, but, but think about what it might be like to raise a child in a perfect world. Oh, my goodness, dear friends, isn't that something that you want for your life? Something to look forward to? A new world for the former things, the Bible says, have passed away. The lame, the Bible says, are going to leap for joy. Now imagine a paralyzed person who's going to spring up from, and they were paralyzed from a tragic accident or, or maybe from a stroke or something like that. They're going to spring up and they're going to beat the 100-meter Olympic record from Usain Bolt. 
They're going to make bolt look like it was bolted to the concrete. You know? They're just going to imagine the blind are going to open their eyes and they're going to see the beautiful flower, the amazing sunset, the brilliant sunrise. The deaf are going to hear, Mother, weep no more for that baby. Jesus will put him back in your arms. Father, weep no more for that son. Wife, weep no more for the husband. It's reality and it's all here in the Bible because Jesus is coming again. Do you hear me tonight? Amen. He's coming again. Coming to give us glorious life forever. Can you imagine about forever? Have you ever tried to conceptualize forever? I, I've tried, and you know, after a while, your mind just starts to short circuit and go nuts on that, right? Because we can only imagine a human lifetime, because that's our frame of reference, right? When I was 25 years old, I thought 50 was forever. And now that I'm 50, that doesn't seem so long anymore, right? <laughs> it's our frame of reference. You know, we think 80, 90 years. From Eden to here, it's been about 6,000 years according to biblical genealogies, but that's a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Because forever is a long, 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 long time. Did I make a point? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and he says forever. Forever all things new. Forever new body. Forever new mind. Forever a new heart. Forever a new city. Forever a new world. Forever everything new. Dear friends, that's why God is calling us out of Babylon. That he might bring us into the new Jerusalem. That's why he's calling us out of sin. That he might give unto us an eternal salvation. He calls us away from this world so that he might give us a new world. And I try to imagine about heaven, you know? I really just sort of kind of have to let my mind kind of run a little wild on that because heaven is just such an amazing place. And, and you say, well, you shouldn't speculate about heaven. You shouldn't imagine about heaven. Well, but it's okay because the Bible says that you can do that. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. And so we don't even begin to have a clue about what heaven is like. So think about, think about trying to travel in space. Forget about rocket ships and awkward space suits and all space shuttles and all that stuff. You know, what do you do? You you want to go, you want to go see the nebula? Huh, you just teleport. You're right there. Imagine studying astronomy by visiting the very star or the very planet that, that you're studying about. Think about hearing the stories of the great Bible heroes from them face to face. Think about sitting in a Bible class where Paul is teaching about Romans or maybe where John is teaching about Revelation. That's the one you'll find me in. And, and imagine listening to Moses telling us about what it's like to trust God to get you out of the wilderness and into the promised land. You see, we can't imagine with our eyes, we can't imagine with our ears or our senses what heaven is really going to be all about. You and I think we've heard some great music. You and I think we've heard some choirs, some symphonies. We've never heard a choir like the choir of heaven. I remember when I was younger um, and, and we went to the city of Vancouver in British Columbia uh, to listen to a 500 voice choir perform the Handel's Messiah. Woo! You talk about goosebumps, uh, levitating out of your seat, you know, because the the acoustics in, in the, in the uh, Orpheum were phenomenal. And, and it just powerful shivers running up and down my spine. But that 500 voice choir, that's nothing compared to the choir of heaven. It's only like a, like a solo. Can you imagine? Billions and billions of angels singing to the glory of God. And you get to be a part of that choir. 
then it's not even going to matter if you have a voice like mine. You can sing as loud as you want and nobody will leave because it will be drowned out, right? Uh, 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 it's wonderful. And by the way, I know that all of our, our young people are into Xboxes these days and Wii's and things like that. Well, when you get to heaven, it's not going to be an Xbox. You're going to have a J-Box there. That's a Jesus box, right? And, and you won't be the, just watching the guy on the screen. You get to jump in and be the guy yourself, right? And, and, and it's all good and it's all uplifting and it's not any violence and any of the other stuff. And so heaven is going to have a J-Box if you're into that. And Apostle said, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for his children. I grew up in one of the most beautiful places, not one of the most, the most beautiful place in the world, British Columbia, Canada. Now, by the way, do you know how British Columbia got to be on earth? Have you, have you heard that? You haven't heard that. i got to give you some very proprietary biblical knowledge about British Columbia right now, all right? Well, you, you remember how God created the Garden of Eden, right? And put it here on planet Earth. And how beautiful it was and amazing it was. Well, when God was getting ready to send the flood, He didn't want to destroy the Garden of Eden. And so He took the Garden of Eden away from Earth. But when He was plucking the Garden of Eden off of Earth, a little corner of it got stuck and got left behind. That's British Columbia. <laughs> And you won't find that and hear that anywhere else. That's just special information here. But I mean, I grew up living by the Fraser River in British Columbia. Incredible mountains, sunrise, snow-capped peaks, sunset, water of the amazing lakes of there. I've seen some beautiful things. But try to visualize with me now. You can close your eyes if you want. Try to visualize the most beautiful paradise that you could ever think of. A place of awesome, incredible beauty. Flowers that cascade, colors brilliant and saturated. The flow of fabulous fragrance through the air. The brilliant sunshine reflecting on a pool of crystal clear yet intense blue water. I don't know what paradise would look like to you. But picture in your mind the most breathtakingly beautiful spot. Have you got that picture now? Compared to heaven, that paradise is nothing but a garbage dump. Compared to heaven. Imagine the most out of the world vacation that, that you've always dreamed of taking. If time and money were no object, what would your dream vacation be? Where would you go? Think about that. Some exotic place that you love to go. I don't know, maybe Tahiti or, or the Bahamas or Bora Bora or Bali or the Caribbean or maybe the Philippines. I don't know. Wherever you will go, whatever floats your boat, right? Think of your most amazing vacation. Do you have that dream vacation in your mind? Compared to heaven, that's like going to work on Sunday morning. I mean Monday morning, not Sunday morning, Monday morning, go ahead. Yeah, that's nothing more than that. Now, I want you to imagine, try to imagine in your mind the most elaborately palatial mansion that you can think of. Just phenomenal home, the landscaping of paradise, granite columns maybe, I don't know, marble floors, stately oak and walnut and maple paneling throughout the house. Imagine this phenomenal mansion where price is no object and you could build it any way you wanted to. I don't know. There's some people, they built some crazy places, you know. I remember when I used to live in Washington State, um, in western Washington, you know, that was in the days when Bill Gates was just building the, uh, the Microsoft empire. And at that point in time, he was only worth $9 billion. Only $9 billion. You know what? I actually sat down and I calculated how long it would take Bill Gates. He had $9 billion. So I calculated if he never made another penny, how long it would take him to spend $9 billion if he spent a million dollars every day. And you know what my calculation told me? 
it would take you 20 years to spend $9 billion at a million dollars a day. Can you imagine? I mean, this is, we, we have no clue. But anyway, okay, so that was my point. My point was Bill Gates bought some property on Lake Washington and he was building uh, his, his estate there. And um, he, he we, you know, we, we hear articles and things about this, this crazy house he was building. I forget how many square feet. I think, I want to say it was like 26,000 square feet. And it didn't have like a three or four car garage. I think it had a 17 car garage. And, and it, wasn't for, it wasn't for the Dodge Neon or the Honda Accord, you know. It, 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 was, for the, it was for the Bentley and it was for the, the Porsche and it was, it was for the Ferrari and it was for all the... And, and, and he was building, his wife wanted pools, uh, pools, but she wanted the pools to be in the Hawaiian Islands. And so the pools were supposed to be set up just like the Hawaiian Islands. And so they got built into this pool project. And they were about, I think they were about a million dollars into the pool project. She decided she didn't like it, rip it out, start all over again. That's just what some people do in, in situations like that. I mean, we can't even imagine. So I, I, have you ever heard of the Biltmore Estate out there in, what is this, uh, North Carolina? The Biltmore Estate. I mean, think of the most palatial uh, mansion home beyond your wildest dreams, folks. Have you got that place in your head now? You got that kind of picture there? Compared to heaven, that most phenomenal palatial mansion is nothing but an outhouse. I'm just trying to give you, you know, the reality of how phenomenal heaven is. The Bible says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for his children. But John the Revelator on that desolate island of Patmos saw the glorious land and he knew that heaven was a real place. A real place for real people to live a real life. I used to have the idea, because we've probably all heard this, that when you went to heaven, you became an angel. Huh? You became a cherub and you sat on this thing, the, the cloud there or whatever it was, you know. And, and of course, being the good little boy that I always was, that wasn't very amazing for me to think that I would be an angel. My mother, that was rather an amazing concept for her to think that I would be a cherub. But anyway, you know, sitting there on this cloud with a harp and a halo. And I'm a kid and I'm like, boring. I don't want to go to heaven. Who wants to sit on a cloud and pull strings on a harp? Oh my goodness sakes. Whoever came up with that crazy idea anyway? You know what I think? I think it was the devil so he could stop us from wanting to be there, right? Because listen to this promise. Go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9. Isaiah chapter 11, 6 to 9. We're going to have to really talk about the reality of heaven in a few minutes here. But first we have to look at some scriptures. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6. And this is what the Bible says about what, what it's going to be like. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fat one together. And the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall graze and their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play with the, by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, dear friends, what an awesome place Isaiah is describing, right? There's not going to be any more savage animals in that place. No more predators and prey. No more survival of the fittest or any of those sorts of things. Because it says that the, la the lions are going to lie, lie down with the lamb and the calf together. I mean, guess what? These lions, everything's going to be vegetarian in heaven, folks. Imagine the lion when he gets to heaven, his first meal there. Fresh clover tossed with dandelions and timothy grass salad. Dandelion leaf salad. Lion goes... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey man, going to be vegetarian in heaven. May as well start getting used to it here, right? All right. Uh, okay, here, where, where am I now? 
Oh yes, and and so then and it says the in, in the Bible it talks about the children, the, you know, with the snakes, and they're not going to bite them and hurt them anymore. Isaiah 65 and verse 21. We want to go there for a few minutes and check that out here. Isaiah 65 and verse 21. They shall build houses, the Bible says, and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and, excuse me, and of their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And thus shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Oh, dear friends, I love this passage because it tells me that I'm going to be able to build a house. And I'm going to be able to live in it. And I'm not going to have to mortgage my life away to be able to be there, right? They don't have to mortgage payment every month and all that stuff. They're not going to come and foreclose. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Not going to be any taxes over there. That ought to make every one of us want to get into heaven. Amen? Isn't it wonderful to think about heaven? I mean, you know, we think about life here. and We talk about security and health. I want to tell you, folks, your health can fail. You talk about security, your bank account can fail you. You don't believe that? You just listen to all the moaning and groaning about Wall Street right now, right? And people's retirements disappearing as they're just watching it every day. It's just great. And, and, and this, yeah, I tell you what, folks. Shattered nest eggs. Having to go back and get a second job. Your bank account may fail you, but Jesus never fails. He never fails. Lay up your treasure in heaven because it will be waiting for you there when you get there. It's not going to disappear on you. The Bible says that heaven is real. I mean, it's real. So I want to get to the reality of it. Because remember, the Bible said, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has entered into the heart of man. What God's, that's what the apostle said. So let's try to imagine a little bit here. Winter is my favorite season. I've got a romance with snow and snow sports, second only to my romance with my wife. Imagine skiing on a planet that's all powder. Three feet of what they call the lightest, fluffiest champagne powder. A whole planet of it. I know you don't imagine about snow planets. I know you got your cloud thing going on. You're sitting there. You can have your cloud, sing your little hymn. Heaven is more real than this earth. And, and so my, I, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a snow planet. That's, that's going to be part of my heaven there. And, 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 no more, and one more thing about it. There's not going to be any, be any more short ski runs and long lift lines when you get to heaven, right? I mean, when you get to heaven and you're skiing on my snow planet, guess what? You start down the hill. Downhill skiing. You know, you got your form. Going down the hill. A thousand years later. Quads aren't burning. And you get to the bottom. And forget the lift line. Spread your wings right back up to the top to start on the next thousand years slide, right? I mean, it's going to be awesome, folks. And, and uh, none of this two-minute skiing, 10, 20, 30 minutes waiting. Oh, no way. And your technique is perfect. Now, that is something I imagine about, perfect skiing technique, because I, I always, I never took lessons to ski. I just skied with people who were better skiers than me. And so you can always imagine that I was crashing a lot, right? And I was skiing on blue runs when I should have been on green ones. And I was skiing on black diamond ones when I should have been on blue runs. And I was skiing on double black diamonds when I shouldn't have been on any black diamonds. So I was doing, my technique was not always the greatest. But I felt like that's the way to learn, ski with somebody who's better than you, right? And so I remember one time going to Whistler in, um, in British Columbia. And we were on a skiing trip. And I was with these 
couple guys were on the trip and they were better skiers than me and we were riding the chairlift and we were they were looking off over to the left and and there was this there was this bowl uh, below the ridge of the mountain and, and there was a there was a cornice there you know what a cornice is okay that's kind of where the snow blows over the sharp edge and it's like a vertical drop and the cornice looked you know it looked like a not a very big cornice and and, and the bowl there's no tracks in it. It's untracked snow. And it's like, they're like, oh, we got to go there. We got to ski that bowl. That looks so awesome. And so I'm like, yeah, okay, let's go ski that bowl. And we got to the top of the lift and we realized why there were no tracks in it. Because you had to take off your skis and hike in order to get there. So we decided we were going to be the ones. And so we took off our skis and we hiked. And we got over the bowl and we got to the cornice. And what looked to be like about a three foot cornice when we got there, it was more like 15 foot cornice. And I come up to it on my skis, and I look over, and I'm like, uh, ooh. And these other guys, because they're good skiers, they're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And so they say, okay, Byron, let's go. Are you ready to go? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. And, and the first guy, he launches off, and he goes over the cornice. He lands in the powder in the bottom of the bowl, does his thing. He's just, he's cutting a beautiful line down the down the slope. And and then the other, my, my second friend, is like, hey, Byron, you're gonna go? And I said, no, you go ahead, you go ahead, you go ahead. So he comes up, puts his ski tips over, he launches, lands it, puff of powder goes everywhere, he comes out of the puff and he's going down his line, beautiful lines. And then I'm like, oh, all right, I gotta go. And I think I'm gonna do or die, and I was sure it was gonna be more dying than doing. And so I launched. And I landed it. I was so shocked. I actually landed it. And I'm going down. And I got my line. And it's an awesome line. And I'm thinking this is so great. And I decided to look at my line. And do you see the middle? It stops. I crashed. I crashed so big, man. My skis and my poles, they went flying everywhere. I was buried under the snow. I had no direction which way was up or down or out. I was just, I was there, and my friends had to come. They were laughing their heads off, by the way. They had to come and dig me out and help me survive. But anyway, I love to imagine about heaven. And by the way, if skiing and snow planets aren't your thing, then think about whatever is your thing, okay? Because you gardeners, you go ahead and plant your vineyards. The Bible says you'll be able to eat the fruit of them. And you can have your peach orchards and, and your apple trees or whatever. Because and, 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 you talk about it's going to have gorgeous fruit in heaven. And you can have your apple tree. Because you know what I'm going to have? I'm going to have me a blueberry pie tree in heaven. It's going to be growing right in my backyard. Big blueberry pies come on. They grow on it four times a year. And the blueberries are as big as cantaloupes. I mean, it's going to be awesome. And, they, and they're in season for 11 months out of the year. Uh, and, and then, uh, I'm beside my blueberry pie tree, I'm going to have a lemon meringue pie tree. And, and then beside, you can have your orange tree, you can have your banana tree, that's just fine. But I'm going to have a snicker bar tree growing there too. And, and I know who's going to come visit who, right? And hang out and eat the fruit of the trees. I mean, you know what a place. Everything is bad for you down here. It's going to be good for you up there. It's going to be health food. You know, ice cream. That's going to be the prescription for good health and longevity. No fat, no sugar, no cholesterol, but it tastes amazing. Right? Uh, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, mouth hasn't tasted the good things that God has in store. I love to talk about heaven. You know, Revelation, it may be a book of beasts, but that's not what it's really all about. It may be a book of nations and wars and cosmic struggles, but that's not what it's really all about. It's about a people who are faithful to God and to His Word. A people who will stand for God though the heavens fall around them. A people who are faithful even when it means being different from those who are around them. A people who will step out across the line for Jesus Christ even if it means being disowned by their loved ones. It's about a people who have trusted Jesus to change them, a people who are not willing to let anything stand in their way or get between them and the world that God has promised for those who love Him. Go in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. 
Uh, he's, uh, it's about a people who determined to follow the Holy Spirit in the light that he's bringing to their pathway and inviting them to walk in no matter what change it may mean they need to make in their lives. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Sometimes we're not sure that we can do it. But we don't have to do it alone because Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do some things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's right. You see, dear friends, He can lead you. He can help you. I have known all kinds of people during my time of ministry. Drug addicts, drunkards, criminals, gang members, rich and poor. I've known housewives, divorced, downtrodden, abused, empty, insecure, afraid people. I've seen all people from all walks of life find release through the power of the Holy Spirit, find transformation through the Christ who said, He can help us do all things. I have seen these people become transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And I've seen them become honorable Christian people and active workers in His church. I've seen their lives become a blessing to their fellow men. For the Holy Spirit, when He gets a hold of us, He sets the captive free and He turns our bonds into freedom. And He uses us for a greater purpose in the world. There's nothing in this world worth keeping you or me out of heaven, dear friends. For it is real. And he says, and he never lied, Behold, I make all things new. I want with all my heart tonight to be there on that day and to be in that new world. I want to make my commitment to Jesus so that I can be with him in heaven and in the new earth. And I hope that is your heart too. And you have no idea how determined I am. I am determined to be faithful to this book. Even if it means being rejected. I am determined to be faithful to what the Bible says. Even if it means being rejected. Because he was rejected. Even if it means being lonely. For he was lonely. If Even if it means being crucified. For he was crucified. For me, and what an honor it would be if I would be crucified for him. Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you that even though we toil through this sin broken world, we toil for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This world is not our home, Lord. We are aliens here, we are sojourners. And we are on our way to a better place. And I pray tonight, Lord, that somehow we've been inspired. That heaven is beyond the best that we could ever imagine here in this life. And that it would motivate us every day to, to commit to you. To walk with you. To spend time with you. And to give Jesus full permission in our lives. And to give the Holy Spirit full access to lead us and grow us and teach us truth. And give us more light that we may walk and not stumble. Yeah. And I pray tonight that you will bless every person within the sound of my voice. To be on that journey with you. So that one day soon when Jesus comes. We can look up together with a smile of joy on our face. And we can say, behold, this is my God. I have waited for him. And he's come to save me. This is my Lord. I'm going to be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Oh Lord, may that be every one of our testimony. Yeah. That we will live not for this life, but for the life to come. That we will live not for this world which is temporary and which is passing away, but that we will live for that world that You've promised us, the one that we do not see, but that is more eternal, that is more real than anything we could ever have here in this life. And so dear God, May we all commit 100% to Jesus. May we hold tight to Him and obey His will in our lives by His grace and by His grace alone so that one day we may enjoy that better land that you prepared for us. I thank you so much, Lord, for hearing this prayer. 
and for keeping every one of us in your grace until that day. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. that time again. Just before we do this very last drawing, we just want to make sure that everybody had a chance to get their registration card in the basket. Everybody's good, right? All right. Pastor Jordan, 